very pleased to be here tonight. That's my first time I attended a Brace Tech event, so hopefully I will not be too off mark, but yeah. Um, I was supposed to talk about cybersecurity, and instead I'm going to talk about schools. So it's a bit of a big change of topic. But due to a running argument between Russia, the UK, and the US, I was not allowed to run the study I was supposed to run this summer about cybersecurity and robots, so I cannot talk about it. There's no study yet. Geopolitics sometimes have an impact on research. Uh, so I'm going instead to present a couple of things about, uh, let's say, the current state of what's going on in robotics for education, for children. And you'll see it's a mix of hardware, uh, machine learning, and maybe a bit of sociology or more psychology things, we'll see. Um, there's plenty of additional material, so if you have questions, we will try to keep the question for the end, but if you have questions, we can also just like start discussing random stuff that you might be interested in, including the ethics of all that and, and things like that. Um, my slides are, I'm, will probably end up on the Bristec website, but they're also on GitHub if you want. Uh, do not hesitate to have a look. And because it's a talk about robots, I think it's only it's needed to have a robot to start with that says hello. Um, that robot with writing on the tablet, I'm, I'll, I'll come back to it a bit later on, but has been used a lot in schools to help children struggling with handwriting. We'll see, we'll see why. But before that, a quick poll. Um, you might not all be like specialists of, of education, but what, what do you think? What is today the, the, the reason why robots are not yet in schools? Random ideas? Cost, Cost is one. Uh, well, they already have smartphones, and I'm not going to change, <laughs> to change that. Um, so cost is definitely one. Um, lack of appropriate teaching material, and, and most of the teachers are not like super techy people, so what do I do with a robot? But there's also like the, the, the shared difficulty of getting, uh, getting like a complex uh, techno technology or uh, like artifact like that to run autonomously in a kind of trust, trustworthy way in, in schools. And if you look at the recent research on robotics, people are very proud to show images like that. They say, "Wait, well, we did a study in a school. And it's one poor child in the corner of an empty school <laughs> with a lot of wires and um, a researcher that is praying for the robot to work because for the last <laughs> five days it was crashing stupidly. Um, and, and once I've been brave enough to try to bring a robot to a nursery and I was very hopeful that I would leave the robot there for two weeks. After two hours I went back home with my robot that was completely broken. <laughs> um, it's just a bit overwhelming, you know, like a bunch of 20 children. They had a lot of fun though, like at some point so that, that robot was a lovely little robot, and they figured out a way to get into it, but not just one child, three child children actually jumped into the robot and started to have like a race in the nursery. <laughs> it it don't, did not really work well. And <laughs> we were super proud of our, our, our pupils there. So they, they were like magnetic things, and we could move them so the robot could have a gaze. We were like super, that's something that was going, would work super well with the children. Within exactly less than a minute, a child discovered that if he takes a little magnet, he can get the pupils and drop them out of the, of the eyes. Oh, oops, sorry, what's that? We'll see. So, so, and they thought it was hilarious. The thing is, if you remove the pupils and you have like a, a ghost robot with white blank eyes, and it was super scary actually for the adults. Anyway, it didn't work really well. Uh, it was fun, but it lasted only two hours instead of uh, two weeks. Um, if I go back to like more like the science -y kind of approach, if you talk about robots and education to, to researchers or engineers for that matter, they will tell you, well, it's really hard because classrooms are very open, not very well specified scenario. It's not like industry where you know where to pick the piece, the parts and everything. No, a school is a, is, is, is a very big kind of mess. Social dynamics are really complex. Uh, interaction between the children, interaction with the teacher, how do you deal with that? There are very lot of semantics to deal with as well. So many object artifact situations that change over the course of the day. AI is not really able to deal with that. And interplay of socio-cognitive functions, and that's probably the core of my work. Like there's 
verbal interaction, they talk to each other, they, there is like non-verbal communication, they, they look, they gaze, they point, they like their body posture, body language tells a lot of things. And of course, they are, we are human beings, like a lot of things happen in our minds that we cannot directly read, access. How do we deal with that? They are all entangled, it's really, really hard. So we were like that, saying, oh, it's, it's just too much of a hard problem. And then two weeks ago, uh, not sorry, not two weeks ago, like early July, I was in Hong Kong. I was invited by colleagues in Hong Kong who have been buying 70 robots. I can show you the picture, maybe. They've been buying 70 of those big paper robots and a couple of nows as well. And they did put 70 robots in 70 schools, mm -hmm. like special needs schools, children with like autism or, or severe disabilities or things like that. And they told, teach the, they told the teacher, do whatever you want with the robots. And the teacher just took the robots and did random things, like a lot of things. They just experimented. They, they, they were not like bothered with all these complex ideas. They just do, did things in the field. And it was like, I was, like amazed to see like, oh, well, actually just, just, just let's try things. And many of those activities were really simple. Like the robot would ask um, the children to, to, to tell the time tables. Not very interesting in terms of programming. It takes like, half, like 10 minutes to program something like that. It was working really well with the children. We're like, okay, wow. Anyway, before going back to that, let's just frame a little bit the problem. That's, let's say that's our classroom. We have like here like more like a social robot that might want to support the learning process. And here we have another kind of robot that is more like about learning robotics or learning STEM subjects, programming, things like that. So we have that interaction between the robot, the social robot, and the child, or the social robot and the children. We have the interaction between the teacher, the robot, and the children. How does the robot fit into the school classroom dynamics and we have the general impact of the robot on the classroom or, or on the school like the fact that yeah well if you are oh that's a, a good example for instance if you need to log in into your robot you have 25 children there are maybe five or six how long does it take it takes about 30 minutes to get 26 children to log in with the robot to do something your 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 day is gone before you have even like and started to, to do something. So there's a lot of concern to be, to, be, to, be, to be taken into account when you want to integrate the robot into the classroom. So let's start with that. And maybe a simple question, what is the most effective learning tool in a classroom? It's an easy one. Well, there's actually two, two, two possible answers. Well, a teacher is not a tool, come on. <laughs> not a tool, like a pen, yeah, a pen and possibly paper as well, like take them together. So yeah, the pen, the pen is, is really, really effective. And why? is the pen really, really effective as a tool? You, you are all technologists, so you should be able to tell me, to answer that question. Why is a pen much better than any of your, of our programs? Low barrier to entry? Uh, yeah. Super, super, like, like, sorry, super easy affordances, right? You just take it and you write. It's, it's also, it's, it doesn't crash. It's hard to crash a, a, a pen. <laughs> and if it does crash, if you break it, well, it costs what? 5p so you, you replace it that doesn't doesn't matter and actually if you if you lose your pe your your pen like it's a beautiful yellow pen but if you lose it you're not going to cry it's it's a pen we, no, we don't care there is no affective bonding with a pen well ho hopefully i don't know maybe some people have that <laughs> um, so there's a lot of properties that are very unique for the pen that makes make, makes it a very very good tool for for, for classrooms it's completely, it's pervasive. We find it everywhere in the, in, the, in the school, but it's completely unremarkable. It blends into the daily r learning routines. It's super trustworthy. It's not going to crash, as I said. We can replace it. It's super cheap as well. So that, that's good. Um, it can be used for many different things as well. So you don't have to buy a yellow pen for English, a blue pen for math, uh, because sometimes you have to buy an app for math, an, an app for, for English, an app so no, the, the, a single tool does, does a lot. And the last one is also very interesting because the last one is the fact, the fact that the pen is effective is important for the teacher. A teacher that might choose between using a pen with the children or not using a pen with the children will use the pen because there is a net gain using the pen. It makes it possible to, 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 to do things that were not possible otherwise. If you bring a nice 
very shiny robot, the, the, the first thing that the teacher will, will, will wonder is, is there any gain for me to use, like spend maybe like a week, two months learning how to use that, 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 that uh, robot? Is it going to bring something to my practice as a teacher? So with this beautiful example of the pen, we were like, can we build as technologists the equivalent of a pen as a robot? Can we turn, uh, can we, wh what, what, would, what, what would it look like, a, a robot pen? If you, if you take a robot like paper and put it in a classroom, ca can you tell me what's, what, what is really wrong here? There's something that is obviously wrong, but I wonder if it's something that technologists like us can easily see. Size of No, the thing that is really wrong is we have one robot and three engineers trying to make the robot work. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, it's not worth it, really. <laughs> so what does it take to build a pen-like robot? We want the robot to be ubiquitous, versatile, effective. So we want, we have that picture and we would, we're like full of, of, of pens, pens, pencils and, and, and booklets and paper and we want to have something like that. We have, we have added here robots that we don't really care about. We don't pay attention to them. We don't, they are, maybe they are not very social. We don't really, they are unremarkable. They are white. They have, they have a shape that is not very interesting. Not something you would really care about. If they break, we don't really mind. So we, we set to build such a robot. And doing that, we, we, we so I, the project, project I did with one of my students at EPFL in Switzerland, we came up with that, that robot called Cellulo. So Cellulo is, is a robot that is that big. Uh, the final shape is kind of an, an hexagon with a very, very simple shape. So in terms of affordances, you don't need to, to have like one or two or three PhDs to know how to use it. Well, there is nothing really to know about it. There is, there is no buttons, there is, there is nothing. You can actually move it because, well, that's easy enough, small enough to be moved, but, but that's it. In terms of technology, it was, it's the most advanced piece of technology I've been building, well, that's the only one, so it's easy, but uh, we do, we, we actually do have a patent on the, on the, on the holonomic drive. So we, we did fit like three little models that were using like a magnetic um, kind of gear. Because one of the problem is if you use like standard gears and you give them to the children, they will move the robots and it will break everything because most of the cheap models are not back drivable. And so you just break the, the gears. So using like, this is, so this is a steel coated, like a, sorry, a rubber coated steel ball and a small magnet magnets that is mounted on the, on the, sh on the shaft of the, of the motor. So you can move it, it will never break. And in the middle, you'll see better on, on, on the next picture, we have a small camera and the camera is doing, uh, is doing a bit of magic. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But that's about it. You could connect over Bluetooth and I call it, well, we say haptic feedback because the robot could, could be back drived. Uh, uh, back driven, so, so, so the robot could like exert some force. You would push the robot in one direction, the robot would try to push you in the other way. So we had this kind of bit, uh, haptic feedback here. And on the surface, even though it was completely flat, it was, we had like five uh, uh, tactile sensors. So we could, for instance, press uh, one of the, of the LED and do something with that. But very, very little affordances, very simple object. White, boring. We, did, we, we were very proud to have a boring robot. <laughs> um, it was also designed to be as affordable as possible. So the prototype, that, that prototype cost around 100 uh, pounds with the idea that we could like mass produce it for like around 30, 30 quid, 30, 40 quid. Um, yeah, okay, <coughs> that's not very, so um, f small video of, it's an early prototype as you can, where is the mouse? Um, it's not doing anything with it. Mm. I don't know what happened. Just give me one sec. It Always the same thing. You test it; it works, and then 
it doesn't work anymore. Uh, display this one. Okay, so that's that, that's all, that, that video doesn't work, but the, there's other videos, so that's fine. So I told you that the, the, the camera was doing a bit of magic. Come on. It's not working anymore. And one of the challenge when you have like a robot indoor is localization. I don't know if you've ever tried to localize precisely, accurately a robot indoor, but if you want to do something with a robot like that, beyond like just giving haptic, haptic feedback, you need to be able to interact with, with something else. And the robot has almost no, cap, no sensors except for that little camera in the middle. And that camera was able to decode that pattern. I don't know if you can see very well, but this is covered with micro dots Maybe you've heard about something called tip toy. It's a bit of a big, big pen that children can use. And you, you put the pen on the, on the book, and it tells you a story of that depends on where you put the pen on the book. And it works using the same principle. So you have like a micro dot pattern that, is, that generates completely unique patterns. And every time you, you look at a small region, like one by one centimeter, you can uniquely identify the position of the robot on a surface that is gigantic, as big as Europe around, or, or, or about as big as Europe. So that's, that's fantastic because it means that you can then create activities like that where you tell the children, okay, you put, you drop your robots, so you, you print that piece of paper on a regular printer. So in schools that's ideal because they have paper everywhere, printers, paper is cheap, printers are there. And you tell the children, you just put the robot on, on, on C, Check, they put the robot there, the robot reads the, the, the pattern on the paper and knows, yes, I'm in the right position, and maybe I will turn on my LEDs to do something. And why it is really useful is because then it opens a lot of, if none of the videos work, it's going to be a bit annoying, <laughs> a bit sad. Okay, I'm going to show you the videos in independently because this one is really good. Um, I'm sorry, I, I do promise I tried, but. So it allows us to do something like that. So we have one robot. Robots do not communicate together. Well, sorry, they do over Bluetooth and over a tablet that was controlling them. And because they all know where they are using a regular piece of paper with just with those micro patterns, they can they can move together as a swarm. And so, for instance, one of one of the example of activity we did it was about the state of matter. So initially, they are all blue, they are all cold, and they behave as a solid. They move all together, and then you start to warm them up, and up they will slowly warm up and start to believe to behave like a liquid. <laughs> and if you do that even more. I don't, I don't, yeah, so after a little while they cool down, so they will go back into a, a solid. And if we were to do that even more, they would start to behave like a gas and they would fill the whole, the whole piece of paper. So that's an example of, of, of acti yeah, if you take two, it goes faster. So what's the paper technology called to get that to It's, uh, it's, okay, the short story is I just called it micro dots because there's plenty of micro dots. The, the technology, be, has been initially created by a company called Anoto, A-N-O-T-O. -O. They've patented it. The patent did come to an exp like expired a couple of years ago, but they never released the code, so we actually reverse engineered their, their pattern to both generate it so we can print it wherever we want and also to, to uh, use it, like to, to do lo the localization. And actually, it's, there's a library called now libdots that, that does that is open source. 
So, so that that's an example of, of things we could do with 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 that. Other other. Uh, oh, so now it's. Oh, what? It's very. I'm very sorry. It's uh, not usual. Okay, so other other examples of, of activities that we could uh, have done, those have not been actually developed, developed, but they would be in principle trivial to do. This one is about like uh, the solar system or like let's say yeah uh, planets. So you you ask the children to to drop the first one in the middle. Chop, it turns yellow because it knows where it is. That's that's a great thing. That's the sun, and then the children can start moving the robots on the different orbits or different planets, and maybe like start to slow them down a little bit. And they would see that the robots crashes on the sun. On the contrary, like accelerate them a little bit, and they would exit their orbit, or maybe get to another orbit, just to make like a physical interaction with the learning, the teaching material. Another kind of similar example but would be about like chemistry. Um, some robots turn, so you drop the robot on this big piece of paper. The robots recognize the activity because again they have this unique locali like unique ID of the localization, and they would all suddenly like immediately turn either red or blue red for, for oxygen and blue for hydrogen. And then children would smash them to create s molecules of water that would start to behave as water. And maybe then you can combine that with the state of the matter to, to show that, for instance, oh, ice actually takes more space than, than uh, liquid water or things like that. Um, I have another video, but I know I think, I think it's going to work. I don't know what, what wrong with that. Mm. I'm very sorry. This is another um, application that this, this time was On peut utiliser ce robot pour um, les exercices thérapeutiques à la maison uh, pour des personnes qui ont par exemple eu un AVC ou uh, qui ont une hémiplégie, ce genre de choses. Et donc on travaille avec um, plusieurs centres ici en Suisse pour développer des jeux uh, avec uh, ici des tâches plus ou moins difficiles. Ici, par exemple, la personne doit tourner, donc ici elle travaille un autre mouvement, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut tourner le robot pour pouvoir collecter le fruit. Donc voilà, c'est un peu plus difficile, surtout pour quelqu'un qui a eu un AVC. C'est gagné L'avenir de ce robot est plus, va plus loin que juste la rééducation. C'est un robot qui est, qui est conçu pour les écoliers du futur. Ça sera vraiment le stylo du futur, justement. On peut imprimer ces, ces feuilles de papier, connecter les robots en Bluetooth et apprendre des tas de choses comme la chimie, euh, la météorologie, la symétrie. On a déjà développé beaucoup d'applications. Donc, c'est tout nouveau. Et on a essayé avec des écoles en euh, plusieurs activités. Et ici, on a une, un exemple, les états de la matière. Dans cet état, les atomes qui, qui sont joués par les robots, les atomes se trouvent dans l'état solide. Et on peut les pousser, on peut les tirer, et on peut surtout sentir la force qui tient le solide ensemble. Je rechauffe. Et je tourne la matière à un liquide. Les atomes bougent, bougent plus comparé à la solide, mais ils restent quand même ensemble, comme le, comme le liquide. Et en fait, on peut introduire même plus d'énergie pour les tourner en gaz, pour les évaporer. Et puis, si on essaie de les tenir ensemble, Ouais, par utilisant la magie de l'interaction tangible, on peut définir des zones qui se comportent comme un frigo. Dans notre espoir, les écoliers peuvent avoir accès à nos robots dès l'année prochaine. Interactive reinforcement learning, so essentially the robot, oh, the robot, the system learns by being shown examples after examples, and when it's interactive, it means that it's 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 not like I build a big data set, I train and I get a result. It's more like I acquire the, the, the examples while doing the thing. It's interactive so with the human in the loop, if you want. But that has not been done a lot in robotics. And it's even, even less so if we take into account social aspects of, of the interaction. 
So we set to, to, to come up with a situation that would involve a real robot. We don't want to make it purely um, virtual. A real interaction with a human, so a robot doing something with a child. A continuous interaction, and that was a challenge. So it's, it's, a, it's not a step-by-step -step interaction where it would be easy to say, oh, a new example, I'm going to learn that and improve my behavior. No, it's something, it's a, it's a real world interaction that where things happen all the time. And a realistic task, something that could be actually used for real in a school, which also means a large input and, and output um, space. And not only about doing the task, but also about learning how to socially behave. And you'll see that what I call social behave in that context is still quite limited. It's ro the robot, for instance, saying, oh, well done. Or maybe you should try a bit harder. Or you know what, let's take it easy. We're going to do something else. Or maybe I should remind you about the rules. All those, what, that's the kind of behaviors that, I'm, that I call social behaviors, even though they are kind of simplistic behaviors. So we came up with a task about food chains. So that's for um, year five students, I think, or year four, I don't remember, that are learning about food chains. So who can eat who? So for instance, um, if you put a wolf next to an eagle, who wins? You know? I didn't know. I still don't know, actually. I don't remember. <laughs> um, but, but it was not obvious, anyway. So the children had, had all those little animals, and they could move them with their fingers. And for instance, uh, if you move the wolf next to the frog, nothing, nothing happened. The wolf doesn't really care about the frog, and the frog doesn't really care about the wolf. Now, if you move the, the snake next to the frog, then oops, the, 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 the life level of the frog would go down, and the, uh, the life level of the snake would go up. And the game was simply to keep as many animals alive as long as possible. So the, the input state was actually quite big, because we were recording all the action of the children. We were recording the current state of the game in the sense of how much life each of the animals had. We were recording when was the last time that the child was doing something, when was the last time the child did something interesting or something like it was just like having fun, things like that. And the action space was even bigger because we had to decide what the robot would do next. And one of the actions for the robot would, could be like, oh, I'm going to move the, um, I don't know, the, the, the mouse closer to the, to, the, um, to the wheat because I want to tell the child, oh, maybe you should try that because you haven't explored uh, that interaction yet and it might be interesting. Or another kind of action could be indeed, oh, well done, you've just discovered a new interaction between two animals. So we, we were in a situation like that with um, the girl, the little girl playing with the robots and trying to, 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 to save the animals as long as, as possible, and a teacher in the loop who was at the beginning completely remotely controlling the robot. He was telling the robot, oh, you should do that, you should do that, you should do that. But little by little, using this interactive reinforcement learning, the robot was suggesting things. It was, so it would actually pop up on the, on the interface. It, it would say, oh, should I, so you would see a little arrow. Oh, should I move the wolf close to the, to the, to the eagle? And the teacher, the actual teacher, could say, yeah, that's a good idea to do that now. Do that. Or on the contrary, no, it's, it's stupid. It's not going to help the child learn more about the game. Or, on the, or the third option was, yeah, why not, but not, not just now. Wait a little bit. I'm going to skip the next slide because there's a video and it's going to crash again. Uh, but the video was just that animated, so it's not very, it's not critical. And the very surprising result was that, how, like, intuitively, how, how many examples do you think we, we would need to have something where the robot is able to autonomously be as good as a teacher at, at training and helping a child to, to, to be good at that game? Hmm? A few hundred? A few hundred? So when I say examples, I should clarify that. So a session would last about, like a game would last about three minutes. After three minutes, I think, yeah, it was three to five minutes. For the really good ones, they were able to keep animals alive for, for three minutes, but animals would lose uh, life anyway to, to make sure that the game would stop. So one session was, was yes, three to five minutes of, of a child interacting. So of course, there's a lot of things happening and a lot of data points acquired during those five minutes. But we were like, we, we had no clue how many children we would need 
until the road was good enough to be, to be autonomous. And it, it could indeed have been like a couple of hundreds of children, would, which would not be very tractable. If every time you come up with a new activity, you need, you need to, to, to recruit four or five schools to train the robots, to then have a robot able to do it by itself, it's not very effective. Here, each of those columns is one child. So we stopped after 25 children. And, and here you can, only, you can see for each of the children, so the, the first one, the, the sixth one, the, the eleventh one, how, how often we used the, the teacher. It's the supervised condition with the teacher behind the tablet. How many times the teacher told the robot, oh, you should congr congratulate the robot, you should uh, draw the attention of the, of the child to something. The different types of action. You remember I told you that the input state was, the action state was uh, 655 uh, dimensions. So, but you can, you could, we could regroup all those actions into categories. And after 25 children, we told the robot, now you do it by yourself. We are not going to tell you if it's good or not, you just try it. And we got that distribution. So we took 25 additional children, letting the robot do by itself. And it's quite interesting because if you look at it, it's a slightly different distribution, which is, which is kind of curious. Why would the robot tend to encourage the child much more than what it had been shown by the teacher. The teacher was using encouragement, but not nearly as many as the autonomous robots. So it was interesting. It meant that the robots kind of learn a behavior that was not really explicitly programmed or explicitly set into the robot. So is it a bug or is it, and it's more likely, just the fact that those 25 children that the robot did see were behaving differently. And the robot said that it was probably better in that specific case to to encourage them. But it's also interesting to see that things like draw attention, for instance, that was almost not used by the teacher, was not almost not used either by the robot. So it w we can see that it was really like learning from the teacher, but we, we, end up, we ended up with something uh, kind of original. The, the, the other very interesting result is that if you, look, if you look at the different children, so we have 25 children, we can see that for each and every children, it was not the same behavior. So the robot was not just did not learn just one behavior that you would replicate for every, every child. No, he was able to adapt to what the children were doing. Something that was even more surprising to us is that usually if, if a child does something correct, like takes the wolf and bring it to the, to the mice, to the mouse, you would say, oh, well done, maybe two seconds later, not two minutes, or not 0.1 second later, there is this kind of social dynamics timing of, the, of our conversation and our social interaction that, that is implicit but very important. And that, that, that's the, the distribution of the action for the, 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 sorry, the timing of the action for the supervised condition. The robot learned to, to ad adjust and, and, and adapt the right and, sorry, uh, exhibit the right dynamics of actions as well. And that's with only 25 children. So we were quite of kind of surprised and really, really happy about that. What does that mean for the teacher? The interesting bit here is that the teacher has been in control of the whole thing, even though at the end the robot is completely autonomous, is autonomous based on what the teacher taught the robot to do. So it's, it's a, a progressive thing. The, robot the teacher decides when he thinks that the robot is now good enough and let the robot go. And it's also a very transparent behavior because whatever the robot does, even though it doesn't, it's not a copy paste of what the teacher did, the, the teacher can kind of explain it because it, it's based on what the teacher did himself. Um, it's also important because in a school you don't want a teacher to the robot to mess up too much. If the robot does something really wrong, or obviously like the worst case is the robot becomes dangerous, but if the robot does something wrong, it can have like very negative impact on the learning. So you want to be able to keep control and the, the, the teacher had the, the ability at any time to take the tablet and, uh, and, and retake control of the robot. So there t it was very reassuring for the teachers as well. Um, but this idea that the, the autonomous behavior of the robot has been co-constructed with the teacher is a very interesting direction for, for AI in schools. Instead of trying to replace the teachers, we involve them into the, the construction of a tool that, that fits their need. Um, I'm going to finish here. This is not a school anymore, <laughs> as you can see. This picture 
comes from a study that finished on Monday, actually, so it's very recent, where we've, we've been using almost the same approach to build a, a coach, a, a training instructor that helps people to, to, that do not a lot of sport, to, to get better at running. I don't know if you've heard of the, the Catch to 5K program from the NHS. So we've been working with, or not with the NHS, but with the program from the NHS to try to get as many people as possible through the program using the robot to motivate them. And in that case, we, we did kind of improve upon the, the, the previous example with the teacher by using the personality of the people as well. So some people are more introvert, some people are more extrovert. So the robot would take that into account when, when deciding if it's better to challenge you a little bit more or to say, well, okay, that's what's good for today. Let's stop and, and do a bit more tomorrow. All right, I'm going to stop here. I'm sorry with, for the, for the um, technical troubles. Um, maybe I can just finish if it doesn't crash with a conclusion. Um, beep. So a few, a few takeaway messages. Um, first, it's not only about child robot interaction for learning, but it's a lot about the classroom interaction. So I gave you this example with the cellular robot, the little white robot that was designed to fit into, to blend into the classroom. There's a lot of work going on and what does it mean for a tool to be not only good for the children, but good and useful for the teacher and for the school uh, um, at wide. Um, we have that question of the balance between a tool and the social robots. So I don't have the time to show you exa the example of the robot that helps you to write, but just in one, in five seconds, the idea here, you remember the robot that was writing hello at the beginning? The thing is, a lot of children that are maybe five or six, they are struggling with writing. And if you're struggling with writing at school when you're five, it's pretty serious because you're going to fail everywhere else. You need handwriting. And so it's kind of a, a you're in a, a bad place, really. And instead of putting a robot to them saying, oh, the robot will teach you or will help you to, to, to learn how to write, we did program, again, using a, a bit of machine learning, the robots to do the same mistake or the same, have the same troubles as those children have, but even worse, and ask the children to teach the robot. So we were turning the children that were the ones struggling into teachers, so reinforcing their self-esteem, and by making them teachers, they would learn by teaching. And that was super, super effective in getting them back into something that was positive, where they, they, they felt they were, they were, they were really uh, having an impact. And here, having a social world was super important because the, the, the children engaged with that because they had the feeling of helping the robot. It would not work with a, a tablet. You don't care about helping your tablet. You do care about helping a robot because a robot has some agency. It's, it's, it's not, it's a it, but it's not quite a it. It's, it's something that you, you care about. And, and so that's a, a complete, the complete opposite of the tool that we've seen where we did not want people to engage with the, in a social way with the white little robot. On the contrary, in that case, we wanted them to engage in a social way, in a deep social way with the robot to help them recover their, from their handwriting difficulties. But finding the right balance is, generally speaking, quite hard. The role of the teacher in the, like if, you, if we tra try to picture the schools in 10, 20 years, what will be the role of the teacher? I think there's a lot of, of, of opportunities to have something that works really well between robots and teachers, where the teacher is, is designing the, the, the tool and using machine learning and AI to design a dynamic tool that can adjust and adapt to, to, to whatever activity the teacher wants to do. And um, yeah, and maybe don't lose the focus. What we want to do is robots to support rich and fun human-human interaction. And hopefully, we're working on it. Thank you, and yeah, sorry again for this kind of mess up with the videos. All that work is really, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad to be talking about it today, but it has been done by uh, the students who are actually the little hands uh, behind most of the programming and, and, and great people to work with. So thank you to all of them. Do we still have time for a few questions? Yeah? Do you have any questions? If we have, if we have, yeah? Go ahead. Do you have a product? So we have a little mini robot. 
I would love to. Um, yeah, so the question was, do we, have, have we turned the, this kind of cellular robot into a product that we can buy? That was the actual, the actual idea. And Iberg, the, that student who did his PhD on the, on the, on the robot, um, did create a startup to kind of come, like turn it into a product, but it was, he failed, he did fail at finding funding to, to bootstrap the whole thing. So the, the, as I told you, the, the locomotion system is patented. There is potential for it, but it has not um, happened yet. If you're interested, <laughs> we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the problem. We got a lot of fibers, but it's. Um, <coughs> when will you be able to come back and tell us about the story you were going to tell? Okay, so that's an interesting one. Um, I was telling some other people that um, essentially it's going to be difficult to do it in the UK uh, because when the university realized that if I was working with a Russian company, some of the American company that. I was not working with them actually, they were just giving me money to do whatever I wanted with that. But they realized that some of the American companies that are working with the university on other projects would, would withdraw because of the US, Russia kind of all embargoes and things like that. They said, well, please don't do it because it's going to cost us way more money than it would bring us. And to be, to be fair, it would probably be the same situation in other universities in the UK. Um, but the project will probably take place in Belgium uh, with a colleague of mine living there. And um, so hopefully it will take place in a country that is less um, subject to American pressures. <laughs> yeah. In the example where you've got the, um, the robot that's being supervised and then autonomous, did the teacher then check in what, did, did, did you have teachers check in what they, the robot was doing when it was autonomous and seeing that its behavior was what they would have done in the same situation or? So, no, in, in, so it's actually, it's a good, it's an interesting question because for that study with the teacher, the teacher that was on the screen was not a teacher. It was, it was uh, one of the researcher on the team. Um, we did not do it with teachers for stupid reason of times and of time where we, we had this, well, we had, we had to, to wrap up quickly the study. However, the next study, the one I did show you in the gym, um, the, the, the guy who was programming the robot was, is a fitness instructor and is, so it, that's his job. And we did a lot of work with him to try to assess what he, what he thought of, of the, the robot behavior. And it, it's, it's actually really interesting. Generally speaking, he thought it was really good. He was maybe a little bit over enthusiastic about the project, so maybe, maybe he was slightly biased toward thinking it was good. Um, but it, 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 was, it was very interesting because it, it, if you think of it, it's a bit weird, right? right? The, it was really like for the, this gym study that it did last like three months. For three months, he was teaching a robot to replace him. And he was really happy about it. <laughs> so it's, it, it, it's interesting. But I think it was interesting for him because it, it did lead him to reflect a lot on what he was doing and how he was doing things. Because of course, you, he had suddenly to explicitly tell the robot what to do and when to do things. And he, he did that by copying what he would have done himself, but he had to make it explicit. So it was, it, I think it was quite interesting for him as well to realize, oh, I w I, I've done that. And, and at the end of the study, he was watching the robot saying, oh yeah, that's a little me, that's, that's fun. And, and <laughs> was kind of seeing in the robots what the kind of behavior he, he, he was, he was him himself uh, having. Yeah. So no, it was, it was, um, it was another researcher that was completely, completely blind to the, um, to the algorithms or how the robot learned or so it was not a property, it was not a trained teacher. It was uh, another PhD student, but she, she knew nothing about how the robot was actually supposed to react or learn or. Yeah, on that picture, it was the, the, the student who did program, but it was just for the picture, for the, for the study, it was another researcher. Uh, just the last one? It's, it's funny enough because it's interesting because like two months ago I would told you I would have told you like oh, I don't know like ten years, and then t two months ago I went to to Hong Kong where it was actually funded by HSBC. HSBC gave those seventy schools 
150 million uh, pounds to buy robots and do things with that, whatever it was. And suddenly, suddenly you discover that, oh, it's actually not, it's actually very doable today to have robots in every single school. And it was in every single school in Hong Kong working with uh, children with special needs. And so something that would have looked like kind of a far, far away was suddenly becoming doable today. I'm actually looking for money right now, like apply, applying for money to try to replicate that Hong Kong exper experiment at a much smaller scale with a couple of robots in Bristol. Um, some of you said at the beginning uh, that cost would, is, is one of the biggest, uh, biggest issue. Co it, it, is a, uh, it is an issue. It, the, the fact that those, those uh, robots, even though Pepper, like the, the big amount of robot that was used in Hong Kong, is kind of the state of the art in terms of robots you can buy off the shelf uh, that exist and is made to interact with humans, it does still require engineers and technicians to around because they break every so often and it's not very easy to recover from that. So it's not yet like something we can just like bring into a school and say, well, for the next two years, it's going to, to run. And once every semester, we come and check on, on it. So it's probably not going to be tomorrow. Um, I guess the, the other thing is, even though we, we, we are exploring a lot of, of interesting use cases, we don't have yet a good reason to replace the teachers. The only good reason is actually there is not enough teachers. and 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 and. It might be the case that at some point the government will decide that it's actually cheaper to, to buy robots and to help teachers than buying, than, than buying more teachers. And that's not something that we want to support anyway. So I don't have any good answer to the question, <laughs> I fear. Yeah. The, um, yeah. I, 10 years' time, yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, will you be around later on? Yeah, I, I, over the yeah I, I, I'll be there until nine or something. Yeah, cool.